Can I start off from there? Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining this evening. Um, in particular, uh, Richard and Declan for agreeing to present at the at the event this evening or, or on our Zoom meeting. Um, the, Richard is going to discuss with us um, reducing the risk of phytophthora. And Richard is working with the Agri Food and Biosciences or AFBI in Northern Ireland. Um, and I suppose Richard has a, has a very good all island sense of plant health and uh, plant diseases. And Declan then is going to present uh, to us some information about oak processionary moths. We, we know it's been in the news this year because we've had the first recorded um, finding of the, the pest and that happened in Dublin. So Declan is going to fill us in on that. And then a little bit about protecting our plant health, our, plant, our protected zone status for the pest. Um, I suppose this is all coming under the, the umbrella of 2020 being the year of international plant health, which really is, I suppose, to encourage um, greater engagement with plant health across the world and to make uh, develop greater awareness for the public and for scientists as well. And particularly, I suppose, in my case, trying to um, get greater awareness for the trade. Um, so it's, uh, I suppose, two very topical um, subjects to cover. So I'll hand over to Richard and I'll let you go through with that. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we go on. The meeting is being recorded and we'll share that on uh, chagas.ie later as well as copies of the presentation. So thanks to Declan and Richard for agreeing to share their presentations. Um, the audience is muted and your cameras are turned off. So I suppose that's to help preserve bandwidth and uh, the quality of the, the presentations for everyone. You know, Richard has said he might turn off his camera as well during his presentation to maintain the, the uh, sound quality. Um, you can pose questions at any time during the meeting and then we can have a, a little questions straight after the presentation and, and discussion at the end as well. And um, I suppose we will take it from there. So I'll hand over to um, Richard and I'll let you take over from there. Okay, so thanks very much everyone. Thanks Donna. Um, hi everyone, welcome to my spare bedroom where I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, photophthora and, and managing their threat. So like Donna said, I'm going to turn off my video just to make um, save on bandwidth. Um, I'm not able to share yet, Donna. Um, I think oh. you might have to activate that part. Um, so my talk today is it, it's kind of aimed at growers and um horticultural people there might be people on with an interest in forestry and um, hopefully a lot of the principles will be they'll work across both areas but certainly kind of the main themes of my talk was um yeah. along the line of um biosecurity and and eradication there's, there's an awful lot of photophthoras out there and a really big threat to plant health from photophthoras okay uh, i can share now And I'll turn off my video. Okay, can you see that, Don? I can, yeah. Great. So, um, yeah, I'm Richard O'Hanlon. I'm a plant pathologist with the Agri Food and Bioscience Institute in Northern Ireland. Um, get straight into it. So, you'll all be aware of, of plant diseases. Um, they've hit, hit the headlines a lot recently with sudden oak death, Tofter or more, ash dieback, and what. Um, Declan's going to talk about later, oak processionary moths. So as a plant pathologist, we've had it good in a way in that we've, we've plenty of work to do and we're hitting the headlines a lot. So we've plenty of opportunities to tell people about what we do. It wasn't always like this. So some work by my colleague in AFB in 2016, they did a survey of almost a thousand people here in Northern Ireland and 81% um, of them had never even heard of a plant disease or couldn't name a plant disease. Um, Worryingly, 70% of them, even though they often went out for walks and forests, etc., they didn't regularly clean their footwear. So that's a big biosecurity risk. And as well as that, which makes our job that bit more harder, um, only less than 1% of them had, had any understanding of what Tree Check was. Tree Check is our, our app um, that allows you to report suspicious plant diseases. So um, it, it, it was kind of stark results that we found there. So we, we really set ourselves about. Um, informing people more about these diseases. So that's why I was happy to come in and speak to you all today. Um, Antiphytophthora in particular, so it's a microorganism, microscopic, and um, 
This image you can see here is a rhododendron leaf up close, um, and I mean very close, many times magnified those little um, silvery looking shapes or ellipses. So those are the sporangia of Phytophthora, the microscopic spores. And just to give you an idea of scale, that's about the size of an average full stop if you were to put a full stop on a piece of paper. So within an average full stop, you can fit 40 sporangia, around about 40 sporangia. So you can see if you imagine a whole leaf area covered with sporangia, that can be many, many thousands, if not millions of them there. So that gives you an idea how, of how, how quickly this disease can spread. A single infected leaf can produce many, many hundreds of thousands of spores, which can go on to infect many, many more leaves and very quickly spread through plants. Um, overall, what we know from this is the island of Ireland. We know that there's 27 species of Phytophthora on the island of Ireland. There's, that's the ones we know. There's probably many more we haven't found yet. Um, at least 19 of these species are not native. So um, they, they came here because of something we do, whether it's trade or whether it's um, movement or, or something else, but it, it's, it's human um, trade or work has led to these species getting here. Um, in, in general about the biology of Photophthora, they, they love mild, wet, damp conditions. So, so the island of Ireland is just perfect. Um, glass houses, greenhouses, um, anything like that, that's great as well. They got, they got everything they need. Very often, you'll see some more of this later on in another slide, but aerial symptoms of Phytophthora, so symptoms on leaves and stuff. The, it, it, the, the disease very often follows the pathway of the water. So if you imagine a drop of water falling on a leaf, it runs down along the midrib, reaches the tip, sits there for a while, then falls off. That drop of water, if that came from an infected leaf, it'll be full of spores. And as it travels down along the leaf, it'll be depositing spores here and there. And that's why you often get disease that, that runs the way gravity runs or the way a drop of water would run. Here's some work, um, Helen Grogan's on the line. So this is some work I, I did a couple of years ago with Helen and others in that we were looking at the temperature um, growth responses in, in Phytophthora remorum. So what you can see here is um, 15 Petri dishes with leaves. The leaves have varying degrees of disease. So each of those Petri dishes in a, in a line as we go from um, top to bottom, each one was kept at a different temperature. So the first three, you can see the, the, the leftmost three plates, um, they were infected with Phytophthora remorum and then stored at five degrees Celsius. So you can see the disease dot on those is quite small. Whereas if you go to the far right of the screen, those three plates, one on top of the other, you can see an awful lot of disease that that's that dark brownish um, area on the leaves. So you can see Phytophthora remorum. And if you look at the blue circles at the top, that's kind of an indicator of the size of disease that we saw. So around 20 degrees is perfect. It, it really likes that temperature. So it just, um, and raises a warning for, for glass houses and stuff. It just, and polytons, it just shows how Phytophthora is, is, is well set to grow in those conditions. Um, <clears throat> how does Phytophthora do so well as a plant pathogen? Well, we, Phytophthora has many really nice tricks. It's almost got the Swiss Army knife of, of getting around plant defenses. It's got all of these specific compounds and um, enzymes that Phytophthora can produce to, in some cases, trick the host defense. So some cases it kind of um, it gets around uh, the plant's natural defenses. So it's, it's evolved really good um, covert warfare strategies. Um, about Phytophthora in general, so <clears throat> on the island of Ireland, you can see this, this line here on the graph. We know there's about 27 species present here. There's probably many more, but we just haven't found them yet. Um, and that's kind of in line, although it's a lot lower than what we know worldwide. So worldwide, scientists are finding new Phytophthoras all the time. The more the more new habitats they survey and um, the more trade that goes on, the more Phytophthoras that seem to crop up, these new Phytophthoras that, that in most cases are a threat to plant health. There are very few Phytophthoras we know of yet that don't cause any disease, um, if any. So it's, it's, a, it's a large group and getting bigger, so there's a lot of work to do on Phytophthoras. How are they spreading? So we know from evidence that a lot of them do spread in trade and in um, commerce. So for example, these um, large um, plants with, with roots and soil attached, trees, whatever. This um, digging mechanism for pulling out root balls. So you can see all the soil on that and also the soil on the trailer. So if someone was to come to come from their uh, premises that had Phytophthora in the soil, say Phytophthora cinnamomy, if they were to dig out some trees using that machine, and then because those machines are rare, I suppose people share them. So then if they brought that machine to your site and used it to dig out your trees, there's a very good chance you will inoculate your site with Phytophthora, whether it be Phytophthora cinnamomy or whatever. You leave that there. Next time you try and plant a tree, you may see problems developing. 
issue with these photophthoras is because they're microscopic um, and because they're often in the soil, there's, there's nothing you can do. To, there isn't like a compound we can spray on the soil to kill them. Nothing has been proven really yet from, from the point of view of a cure. So as we always say, it's, it's all about prevention and biosecurity. We, we, it's almost impossible to fix if you get a photophthora infection in the soil in your site. Um, there's very little you can do about it, half from maybe leaving it fallow or putting some resistant plants in there, but certainly that's, that's a lot of hassle. So it's just so much easier to prevent it. And that's going to be a real theme of my talk today. This is an example of um, what we know from Europe. This is a couple of years old, but certainly it still stands. So you can see the amount of spread of Tophtera remorum within Europe. So you see these dots here. Each one represents a member state. Um, the arrow designates the direction of travel of infected plants. So you can see, for example, um, we'll take Belgium. So between that time, Belgium, which is at the top right of that figure, um, Belgium sent infected plants to the UK and to Ireland. Um, Ireland in our case, so we were receiving infected plants from Italy, from Netherlands, and from Belgium. So you can see it's, it's, it's a big web of these infected plants traveling around. So it just shows you that some plants do slip through the inspection net. <clears throat> So it's, it's kind of imperative on all of us to keep our eyes open and to watch for these things um, in, in our own areas. So this is a, a table with a lot of data. Um, it's some work we did a couple of years ago surveying for photophthoras um, in trade habitats, but also in non-trade locations around, around Ireland. Um, I think there's about 27 species or maybe less on this on this figure. But what I want you to look at is just there on the second last column, there's the red boxes indicate if they were found in trade locations or traded plants. And the uh, last column is in non-trade, so it's in kind of wider environments. So there was a couple found in trade um, in plants. But also, this isn't to say that the ones not found in trade aren't there. It may be just that we haven't found them yet because many of the ones that are red in the non-trade column, they're well known in other countries to be spreading in trade. So it may be just a case that we didn't find them. So it's certainly, um, that's, that's a checklist for you all for things to be worried about. You know, each one of these can cause significant damage to many different plants. Um, even worse, I suppose, financially, is that some of them have um, a regulated organisms. So any one of the names with an asterisk there, so Phytophthora cactorum, Cambivora, Cinnamome, Cryptogia, and Phytophthora morum. So they're all regulated in one way or another under the, the EU plant health regulations. Um, so they're, they're worrying if they're found, something will have to be done about it. So it can often lead to financial hardship and loss. So it's just these things, prevention is always better than cure. Here's a, a focus on Phytophthora more and probably the one most people will be familiar with because it's, it's the one that we're really worried about in terms of um, EU regulations and, and host range. So what you have here, um, all of these plant plants and um, genera so these are all the plant genera and species it's been found on in ireland so you can see a really 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 wide range of um commonly bought and sold plants um, it's it's a regulated organism under emergency measures uh, so so yeah it's a problem in trade but for the people for all of us i suppose that that enjoy the outdoors it's also a problem in the wider environment in particular in uh, forests so we had a kind of an, an outbreak that started around 2010 in Ireland and Northern Ireland around the same time. Um, it, it's now present in, in Ireland, kind of along the south and east coast in Northern Ireland, it's kind of more widespread across. Um, and we think we're, we're almost certain that the way it got there was on, on traded plants. So there is some evidence to say that the the population that's circulating within uh, traded plants in some cases is also the population we find in the wider environment. So that may be how the plants got in and then they were planted somewhere and then they died or else somebody didn't clean their boots. And we'll probably never be able to trace the exact smoking gun of how this got into the forest, but um, it didn't come here naturally, I suppose is one thing I can say. Right, so I'm going to do a little bit about symptoms and then I'll get into a particular uh, interesting case study. So symptoms, like I've said, above ground symptoms with Phytophthora, as you often get, you get lesions on leaves. These are the picture on the left here is on rhododendron. So you can see again, the disease on the leaf is probably tracking along the midrib. So again, if you imagine a, a droplet of water containing a couple of spores landed somewhere on this leaf and then followed gravity down along the midrib, had a least resistance, hung on to the tip for a little bit and then fell off, maybe hit the leaf underneath it and continued on its way down. 
So that's often the way you get phthophthorid um, symptoms above ground is kind of tracking, as you might imagine, water flow because these spores do spread in water. You also get symptoms on the stem. And actually, that's where the name Dr. Remorum came from. Uh, Remorum is, is some kind of Latin term for, for stem, causes disease on stems as well. So that's a stem of the rhododendron there on the right with some uh, lesions and blackening. So that are photophthora that, that we can see and that kind of seem obvious to a plant pathologist. There's also ones that don't seem readily obvious. And these are two cases. Many photophthora, photophthora in general is actually a soil-borne organism. You might, might be surprised seeing as most of the ones we hear about are ones that cause above ground symptoms. But these two plants here are affected by photophthora in the roots. Um, plant on the right is a rhododendron. Just displays kind of typical symptoms as if the plant um, has undergone drought. So what happens is photophthora has killed the fine roots. The fine roots are used for soaking up water. So without fine roots, you get um, drought-like symptoms and eventually death. Plant on the left is an interesting one. This is one we were called out to look at um, in a, a horticultural garden. This was a Fraxinus, an oriental Fraxinus planted. There were two of them planted close together. One died just like this, and the other one was fine. So we had a look at it, couldn't figure any above ground symptoms. When we dug it up, we found that actually there was very little fine roots. A lot of the fine roots had or gone, probably killed. So once we tried to isolate from the fine roots, so the remaining roots, we isolated Phthophthora cinnamomi. Cinnamomi was known well in that garden. So um, we found the case and um, the disease in that case. Some more images of a uh, yeah, fine root death and Phthophthora lateralis is the cause of the disease in those trees in the top left. So you can see it just um, the total death of the plant very quickly. Right, so here's a little case study I want to get into um, just to illustrate the fact that prevention is better than cure. You don't want this thing getting into your nursery. So here we have a, this was a setup in one of my previous jobs where we had um, lots of other engines who were doing experiments, but I'm going to use the, the photo as a kind of a backdrop to this study by Serrano, which is a study from California. So what they did in Serrano, they wanted to know if um, the disease would spread and how quickly it would spread in a, in a container or, or a, a glass house full of rhododendron. So what they did was, they infected a couple of leaves on two plants right on the corner. So we'll say these two plants here, they infected them with droplets of photophthora spores and then they, they, they watched spread and they monitored spread by using um, testing of plants. What they found was that after less than six weeks, the disease had spread within the plants. So although they only infected four leaves in each plant, it had spread to, we'll say, I don't know, 20 leaves within those plants. So already within less than six weeks, the disease was spreading in the plants. So they were watering from um, overhead as well. So you get a lot of water splash and stuff. So the, the spores were just spreading around very happily. After six months, they had found that the disease had spread from the two originally inoculated plants, three plants away. So they had spread to the third plant in the row. From there, they had spread to the fourth, from there to the fifth. So they, within six months, they had spread within, um, between plants, I suppose you could say. Also worryingly, they had spread in water. So at this stage, somewhere between six weeks and, and six months, they started detecting phthophthora spores in the water that they were collecting from the runoff. How this was happening was, so you're watering from above, the spores are being washed off the leaves and they're going down through the soil, and through the roots, and then ending up in whatever kind of container they were using. If you, I'm not sure how many people do it, but if you were um, recycling that water or releasing that water, well, there's a, there's a chance that phthora spores will be released. If you're recycling the water, well, then there's a chance you'll be taking a really nice concoction of phthora spores and spreading it again. So I, the, the main message here is that once these things get in, they can, they can creep along very quickly, you know, actually. Um, and if, unless you spot the symptoms and you can do something about it, well, then you can very quickly end up with a, a big problem what would have happened? So if we look at the, the EU um, emergency legislation, for Morum, what would have happened in this case? If this was a nursery and it was found, the official actions might be something like um, any plant within two meters of the infected plant will be destroyed. So that could end up in that case with many plants, we'd say 20 plants destroyed from that photograph. Also, um, any plants within 10 meters of the infected plant would be, ho would be held. There'd be an order probably put to hold them for more than three months and they'd have to be tested as well. So it's just a huge headache. You'd have a whole consignment of plants that would be held up pending further testing. And also there's just the, there's the stress involved with, with having the, the worry of having a photophthora in your site or, or whatever kind of location it might be. So the main message of this slide is just prevention is definitely better than cure in these cases to, to keep things out rather than try and deal with them once they get in. Um, talking about keeping things out or, or managing them once they get in, I thought this would be some nice um, data we, we did a couple of years ago there with, with some students. Um, 
we wanted to check which biocides were best. So um, in terms of um, biosecurity, cleaning boots and, and cleaning surfaces is important because spores can survive for a while or else they can survive in leaf material and spread. So what we did was we set up a couple of very simple tests looking at GS fluid, which is a kind of a general biocide, maybe lots of people use as sterilant, um, bleach, and also this other um, quaternary, quaternary ammonium compound, this EnviroCare. Um, we set up a test to see both would concentration affect the ability of it to kill Phytophthora and would time of exposure. So what we had was we had pieces of little pieces of rhododendron leaves that were infected with Phytophthora morum, and we treated them in these two different ways. Um, what I really want you to do is graphs here, and um, there's, the bars are very high for J's fluid, for bleach, and for water, and they're quite low for EnviroCare. So basically, what the main message here is that those red circles kind of highlight the EnviroCare was the only thing that actually had any efficacy against Phytophthora or more. Um, and what I would take from this, EnviroCare wasn't perfect as well. So what I would take from this is actually not so much use EnviroCare or other of stuff, but the absolute key things that you physically removing, old fashioned physically removing debris with a brush is just vital, you know. Um, in some cases, you, you'd want to expose infected plant material for a very long time with these biocides. So absolutely, uh, what, what should be done as, as a bare minimum is a good scrubbing, good scrubbing brush in your car if you're going to a forest, scrub off um, leaf material from your shoes. Um, physical removal is important. Biocides have a part to play as well. So this is my last slide. Um, just to kind of recap on some of the points I talked about, but also um, it, it all kind of feeds into my message about just prevention is better than cure in these cases. So um, buying from a reliable source, we say that to everybody. Um, it, it's just important that you know the source and you know the plants have been um, raised well. If you can, I'm not sure how many people can, but, but setting up a quarantine place where you can store plants until um, you're sure they're safe, it, it makes sense on paper. I'm not sure how practically people can, can implement it or not, but certainly it's the gold standard if you can have a quarantine area, because at least that means that you haven't mixed your plants. And if you take in a single batch with a couple of infected plants, all that affects if they're quarantined is that batch. Whereas if you were to disperse, to disperse them, amongst other batches of plants, well, then your problem has just got a lot bigger and there'll be a lot more quarantine um, implications. Excess water, Phytophthora loves excess water, moisture. So if you can reduce water, don't have water sitting in pools, because actually some studies we did in forests found that Phytophthora more happily survives in, in muddy water for right throughout the year, whereas in other matrices it, it doesn't survive so well. So don't have excess water kind of sitting around for people to, to walk in. Um, Regular checking and monitoring of plants is vital because the sooner you pick these, these things up, the better. Good hygiene, so that, that, that's mainly pointed at the fact I was saying about cleaning boots and, and cleaning shoes and cleaning leaf material, you know, infected leaf material needs to be disposed of properly. And just as, as a last point, I suppose it leads nicely into to Declan's work. Work, work with your NPPO, they're, they're there to help you, you know. Um, they're the ones that can, that can guide you in, in managing these cases. And um, with that, I'm finished as my email address if anybody ever wants to, to drop me a question. But for now, Donald, I'm not sure if we're moving to questions or if we're going to hold them. Um, we have a, a question there from you, and so we'll, we'll take that while we're, we're there. You and Fuller has asked, um, does the efficacy of the biocide change with the material that it's treating? So, for example, is it more effective on rubber welly boots as opposed to infected leaves? Yeah, hi, Hubert. Hubert, um, good to hear from you. Um, so. Our main concern here wasn't that the spores would survive on surfaces. There is some evidence that sporangia don't survive so long on solid surfaces, we'll say, or, or boots or, um, or, or countertops or whatever it might be, or plant pots. Um, they really do need a bit of soil or a bit of kind of humus or plant material to survive. So our main worry here, we think, from the epidemiology of disease, we think the main spread of photophthora happens when it's associated with soil or with plant material. So we were really, it, 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 yeah, the efficacy of the product probably would have been a lot better if we were to, for example, apply a solution of spores to a welly and then test it. But certainly the Phytophthora or Morum, whether it was in Sporangia or Mycelium or Chlamydospores, it was able to survive happily inside in, um, whatever size of a leaf material it was. It was happy out in there, even though we had treated it with something like five minutes of biocide. So it, it wasn't killing the Phytophthora and the leaf material for sure, but it probably would, those biocides probably would be more effective if it was just um spores sitting on a countertop, for example. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's been a, 
a message that's gone out with COVID-19, how effective um, biocides are. They're more effective when there's no organic matter there. So clean yep. hands can be desanitized, whereas unclean hands has, have to be washed first. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. We've um, time for one other question there. And Tom Hoolan, has there been any recent study on the distribution of Phytophthora in Ireland or all in Ireland? And Northern Ireland? Um, so we do monitoring in Northern Ireland for um, Phytophthora murum. Um, the, the Department of Agriculture up here would, would collect samples of um, different plants in, in terms of um, nursery plants, but also wider environment surveys and trees. So that map I showed, um, it wasn't entirely up to date, but um, there probably isn't that many new dots to add to it. The map from Ireland I took from um, the, the recent uh, Forest Service DAFM publication, so that's fairly up to date. Um, like I said, we do surveys. We don't have the results of those to publish yet, and it will be dearer publishes them in the end, but um, we, we don't imagine, well, we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we haven't had a huge amount of spread since what I showed on that map um, earlier. Okay, thanks very much. I think Tom was actually specifically asking about Phytophthora only. So. Oh, sorry, I, I, I thought it was a little more. Um, Phytophthora only, um, no, and, and actually, you know, we've never found Phytophthora only in Northern Ireland, so we, there's, there's a study we worked on, it's, it's currently um, we're re rewriting, it's come back with changes for the journal Irish Forestry, so we're hoping to have that in, in the next journal of Irish Forestry. We spotted some diseased alder along the River Lagan in Belfast and did some surveys and some testing. And actually, we, we assumed it was Olney, but it turned out to be Phytophthora lacustris, which is a, a different species altogether, but also known to affect alder. Um, there hasn't been any wide-scale survey of alder health in Northern Ireland, so we, we really don't know. We assume it's here because Phytophthora Olney was found at several sites in Ireland in different places. Um, but we, we've never found Phytophthora Olney or any of its close relatives in Northern Ireland. Okay, well, maybe that's good news. Um, okay, well, Richard, thank you very much. Um, you're going to stay on the line. Well, um, yep. pass over to Declan. So thanks again. So uh, Declan is going to chat with us about the oak processionary moth, which is our new, um, I suppose, concern on oak trees. So thanks very much. And Declan, I'll pass over to you. You can share your screen now. That's great. Yep, you can see that. Okay, thanks, Donald. Um, my name is Declan Keeley, working with Spark for Agriculture and food. And to Stephen, I just want to give you an update on oak processionary moss uh, and its finding in June of this year in, in Dublin. And uh, thank you to Chagas and Donald for inviting us to, to uh, give our presentation this evening on oak processionary moss. So just by way of introduction, I just want to give you a bit of background to the pest and the life cycle of the oak processionary moss. A bit of detail on the uh, oak processionary moss interception uh, of Ireland, of course. Yeah. Sorry, Declan, just before you go on, your microphone's kind of coming in and out a little bit. Maybe if you just straighten it up. Yeah. Okay, is that any better, Donald? That's loud and clear. Thanks. Okay, thanks all. Um, so then looking at um, the ways we can maintain our protected zone, we have a protected zone for oak possessory mosh and looking at how we can protect that, that zone. And also, to, I suppose, to end in, a, in an opportunity, um, so how all of this can we can turn this into a big opportunity for Ireland and the export of, of oak trees uh, to the UK and the rest of Europe um, with, our, with our protected zone status. So just a bit about, bit about the background then. Um, oak possessory moss is a native species of Central and Southern Europe. Um, and at this stage, it's, it's widely distributed in the areas. Um, it has started to move up towards Northern Europe in the last 14, 15 years. And at this stage, uh, we've had findings of, of OPM in, in uh, Southern Sweden. Uh, it moved to the UK first in 2006 uh, from product that was planted in uh, 2005 in a housing development area. And that's down in the London area, um, 
of, of the UK. It's thought that uh, climate change and increase of temperatures is the reason why this pest has, has moved northwards in, in Europe. So that's just a, an image there of the of the, um, the obsession mat at the caterpillar stage. So just to go through the, the life cycle, there's four main stages to the obsession mat life cycle. Um, and, and I just want to go through them stages now in a, in a bit more detail. The first stage is your egg stage. Uh, the second stage is the is the caterpillar stage, uh, the third stage, the pupa stage, and the fourth stage, the, the moth itself. So the first stage being the, the egg stage, uh, and this takes place from mid-August to April. And it's a very wide window. I suppose this is, is due to the, the temperatures between Southern Europe and, and Northern Europe. And as you can see there, the, the egg plaque on the bark of the, the oak tree, uh, it should be very difficult to detect that. And you can imagine looking at a three meter tree on a nursery looking at it uh, and trying to find that egg plaque. And then uh, in areas where, where OPM is becoming more established, uh, to actually see that in a public place or a park uh, on a mature oak tree would be near an impossibility. And the other concerning thing about this is that uh, the egg stage of the OPM is the time of year when, when there's a lot of oak product being traded between root ball and bare root product during the, the dormant months. Moving on to stage two, which is, is very which is April to, to July, and uh, our first interception finding was in June this year. Uh, so the, the image there on your left is the, is the OPM uh, caterpillar nest, and they, they tend to move from, from nose to tail, so they form a, a procession, and hence the name oak processionary mosh. So uh, the caterpillars move up and down the, the oak tree, uh, feeding on the foliage, the foliage of the and leaves of that tree. So then, on the third and fourth stage, then the, the third stage we were saying is the pupa stage, where it's where it's moving from a caterpillar uh, to the moth, and then the, the fourth stage when it's when it's the moth. Um, I suppose if if we're seeing a lot of moths and we're seeing um, moths, I suppose we're starting to lose the battle as regards OPM because that moth has gone on then to, to lay the eggs for the following year and the, and the cycle starts again. So this is just an example of the, the foliage um, on, the, on the oak tree leaves and the damage that, that OPM can cause uh, to oak trees. And uh, findings uh, across the Europe has shown that, that you know, in heavy infestations uh, the, the caterpillar will move to other species and other trees, such as beech and hazel and chestnut. So that's concerning as well, but uh, that's only in, in highly infectious areas uh, where there's a lot of OPM uh, caterpillar nests. So normally the, the plant health concerns we have in, in plants uh, are, are a plant health issues, but for oak possessionary mosh, uh, it's a human health concern as well. So it's probably as much a human health concern as a, as a plant health concern. Um, if, if human skin comes in contact with the, with the hairs on the, on the caterpillar, uh, they contain a, a protein that, uh, that gives a rash on, on, on the skin and can cause irritation. And can also cause irritation uh, in contact with eyes and, and throat. And in, in some people, it's, it creates breathing difficulties and also in pets. Um, so like that's a major concern on the human health side. And when we had our first finding in June of this year, as part of that, we informed the Department of Health uh, of the issue. So it's a little bit different than, than other uh, plant health diseases that uh, we have to deal with. So with that in mind, um, the other caution of design, we, we want people to remain uh, vigilant for the sightings of, of caterpillar nests, but also that's with a word of caution that not to touch them. Um, not to come in contact with them. So we have a, an email address there to report any suspected findings and a hotline number. And also, as Richard was explaining, the, the Tree Check app, uh, which is available in, in Southern Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the UK. Uh, so that's a great tool as well for, for reporting cases. So now we just want to move on a bit to, uh, to the finding we had in June and the, the detail around that. Uh, it was the first finding of of oak possessory mosh in Ireland's protected zone. Uh, it was reported to Daffin by a member of the public. Uh, there was a lady out walking. She, um, she spotted uh, the caterpillar uh, nest on a, on a freshly planted oak tree 
and uh, she decided to take photographs of it. And this is the actual photograph she took on the right hand side of your of the, of the side. Uh, so this is the only official photograph we have of an Irish OPM caterpillar nest, and hopefully the last one. Um, so she did an excellent job in reporting that, uh, and she also took a photograph of the plant passport that was on the tree. Uh, so that gave us uh, a step ahead as regards tracing this product. So upon receiving the report, um, Daphne staff moved to, to remove the nest from the tree, um, get samples into the lab for formal identification uh, to see it was oak possessionary moss. Um, and, and then I suppose we turned to the to traceability part uh, from our plant passport and uh, it was traced back to a consignment that came in from Belgium. So the, the individual tree was part of a bigger consignment that came in from Belgium and that tree was removed and destroyed and all the other trees um, as part of that consignment were also removed and destroyed. So then following off from that then, um, we, we had to report this to the EU Commission. So that's part of the, the uh, reporting on traces. So that uh, would have sent a memo to every member state in Europe uh, informing them that there had been an interception case of OPM in Ireland. And we also would have contacted uh, the NPPO in, in Belgium about the finding and liaise with them. And then as I mentioned, um, we talk also uh, contact the, the Department of Health. So following off from that as regards um, a survey, we intensified the survey in that area of in Dublin where the where the finding was. And to date we had no we have no other uh, findings of of caterpillar nests or oak possessionary mosh. So the way we done that is with the forum trap there that you see on the on the tree. So that's one of the traps we would have put up. And that's forming part of our annual survey for uh, 2020 on OPM. So then moving on to our protected zone we have for oak possessionary marsh and how we're going to maintain that protected zone and the, the crucial uh, steps we need to take to, to protect that and protect ourselves. Um, I suppose, first of all, uh, a protected zone, what is it? A protected zone is an area in the EU where, where, a, pet, where a certain pest um, that can survive in the EU is not present. Uh, so it's free from, from a pest, which Ireland is free from oak possessionary marsh. Um, it sets up, the EU, EU sets out that this protected uh, zone uh, where the pest can, has conditions where the pest can, can establish. So OPM could establish here. And it also uh, states that the, the pest could have a, an unacceptable impact from an economic point of view, which is true for OPM on the horticulture end of it, uh, social end of it, and the environmental impact. So we have that protected zone since 2014. Um, and now it's about uh, maintaining that protected zone and, and how we're going to do that. So first of all, I suppose to look at simply um, if we promote uh, growing and the use of Irish oak trees, a uh, very simple way of protecting our, our, our protected zone, uh, use Irish products. And I know that's difficult if we have uh, landscape designers in, in lists of, of products on a, on a pricing list that um, that, create, that are listing out uh, oaks that are not available in Ireland. So maybe 18, 20 mil, 16, 18, 20 mil Gertwish uh, oak trees. And um, you know, we'd like to know about, about this sort of thing with landscape designers so that we could do a better communication piece with them to inform them that of the oaks that are available uh, in Ireland and the risks that are, are involved in importing uh, these larger oaks. Um, we also push into legislation of strengthening the, um, the legislation around the importation of oak of Quercus trees that are, are eight centimetres more in girt and greater than 1.2 metres in height. So um, that's setting out the criteria there that, that they need to come from an OPM uh, where OPM does not occur, uh, a pest free area for OPM or an area under physical protection, which is under glass. So I don't think there's much oak grown under glass across Europe. Um, so when we brought out that uh, increased um, legislation for importing oak, the Netherlands informed us that they could not meet these requirements. So if anyone out there in the horticultural end of it is thinking of importing oak from the Netherlands, um, it's illegal to do so from, from the Department of Agriculture point of view. 
So then in maintaining our protected zone, notification is going to be a, a big part of it as well. So we've set out there that the Department of Agriculture needs to be informed in advance of all coming into the country. Um, and then the sort of information that's required is the date of arrival, the intended destination, the genus, species, and quantity of products, the identification number of the supplier of them trees, and the name of the country and where they're, they're coming from. So this allows uh, that from uh, carry out inspection of these and cons consignments and to ensure that they meet the SI requirements that we've set out in, in legislation. Uh, it will also help to, for, for the country, for the horticulture industry, to develop a profile of, of uh, nurseries where, where it's safe to bring oak from and it's not safe to bring oak from. So also in maintaining our protected zone, uh, we need to keep carrying out our surveys and, and extend our surveys as we, as we have done this year. Uh, we've, been, we've been carrying out these surveys since 2011 with Fernham traps and lures um, on our, since our protected zone uh, in 2014. And you can see there on the right of the slide, you have the OPM trap and then the, the lures on the, underneath the, the moths there. And uh, two pictures of the moth. The moth on top there is your female moth, and the moth underneath is your male moth. So we change these lures uh, every four weeks. And the concept of the idea is that the the um, the lure will will give off the sexual scent of the female moth, and then it will attract the male moth into the hormone trap. I just want to show you this uh, slide. Uh, you may not be able to see much detail in it, but it's just a message that I want to get across here. Uh, this is a slide that shows the spread of OPM in the UK since the first finding in 2006. Um, so if you take it in the, in the middle of the, the slide there, uh, there's a yellow box, and that's where the first finding of OPM was found in, a, in the London area in 2006 in a housing development. And then each line round about that in the different colours right up to 2019 shows the spread of OPM in that area since that date. So um, it's alarming to see that the area that, that that has gone out from in the, in the last number of years. Uh, and they would be doing the trapping the same as ourselves and they would have the service. And at this stage, uh, the UK have lost their protected zone status for this area while they still have a protected zone status for, for other parts of the UK, uh, they don't have it for this area. And some work being carried out in the UK, um, initially the thought was that, that the moth would, would fly around a kilometre and a half from the original oak tree or the, the nest where it was hatched out from. Um, and work that's going on in the, in the UK is, is beginning to show that um, this moth can fly about seven kilometres from the, from the oak tree. And that would tie in with other research work that's been carried out in, in Southern Europe. And the female moth tends to say more local to the, the oak tree it originally came from or hatched out from, and the, the male moth seems to, to move up to the seven kilometers. So again, that makes it more difficult to, to try and control this pest. So I think that's a, a very good message uh, on, that, on that slide to, to show the, the, the potential spread of the pest. Um, so OPM treatment and control in the UK at this stage, uh, the UK are, are having to treat uh, individual trees in, in parks and public areas um, by spraying the tree. And the others, there's other difficulties with this as well. It's the timing of it. It's uh, biodiversity. You, know, you can get rid of your OPM, but then all other flora and fauna and, and all the rest are you, are you killing at the same time. So that's another issue around the, that treatment. So the other way of maintaining our protected zone is, is through good communication and good awareness, as, as Richard uh, mentioned in his presentation as well. So we have our, our dedicated uh, email address, our hotline number, and tree check. And social media, we've, we've embarked on social media with OPM, um, and this has had a massive response um, from, our, from our finding last June, uh, where we put out information on the finding and ask people and the public to be more vigilant in, in, in looking at oak trees if, if out and about on, on public parks and public areas. Uh, I suppose there's only so many oak trees that 
the Department of Agriculture people can get around to and 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 do the service on. Uh, but if you've all the public people and messages going out to them, well, that uh, increases your your survey uh, fourfold. So we've a massive response to that, and we've well over half a million views to our to our uh, communication postings on on Twitter and Facebook. So the other way of uh, improving and maintaining our, our protected zone status is uh, through the new regulations that, that you all love that come in in December 2019. Um, and these are, the for, these are the first overhaul of plant health regulation in 40 years. Um, this new plant health regulation is more focused on prevention rather than, rather than a cure and highlights high risk plants, I suppose, like um, the old problems with Ciella, um, and I suppose risks that, that, are, that are relevant to the different uh, countries within the EU. It also expands the, the, the operators, the professional operators that need to be registered with DAFM. So uh, not only does a nursery, a garden centre need to be registered with ourselves, but also at this stage, a county council, a landscaper, um, a retailer and online sales, they all need to be registered uh, with the Department of Agriculture. So that leaves it that each, each step in the chain or each link in the chain uh, will be registered with us. And that allows us then, if there's an issue with a, with a plant pest, uh, we have a direct link back to, back, to, um, back to the chain of events of the, of the product from, from it leaving the nursery to be planting out. Um, also on the, on the plant passport, um, it's harmonized uh, the plant passport that's, that's come with plants between professional operators. Um, so the, the example of the plant passport you see on the, on the top right hand side of the slide there, uh, that's universal across Europe uh, in that the letter A is always the botanical name of the plant. The letter B is the nursery supplying that plant or producing the, the plant passport. C is the traceability code and D is the origin. And that's the very same all over Europe if you go into any garden centre or nursery all over Europe. Uh, and then on top there with the plant passport, the protected zone. So there are the EPO codes uh, that's required for the, for the uh, protected zone and there are the two for oak possessionary mosh. So again, the, the strengthening of the legislation will help us maintain our protected zone uh, going forward. Also, an uh, initiative uh, DAFM took on last year, uh, I suppose in response to new legislation coming in, we put together a plant health uh, biosecurity strategy. And I suppose we're looking at three main pillars on this, uh, the risk anticipation, so um, the preparedness of a, of a pest risk analysis of pests coming in, um, the risk surveillance and management, the scientific capacity and from a lab point of view, uh, dealing with the pest. And then a big pillar of it is the awareness and communication. And I suppose that's again what this evening is about as well, awareness and communication of OPM. So then other ways we, we get our message out or we're trying to engage more and create more awareness um, is first of all uh, through Bloom. Unfortunately, it didn't take place this year, but we did take part in Bloom at Home, send out messages, um, and then our Don't Risk It campaign. And we, we bring our, uh, our bugs to, to different stands around the country um, to show the, the risks involved of, of bringing plants and plant products across borders. Uh, also, as, as uh, Dole mentioned, this is International Year of Plant Health 2020, uh, protecting plants, protecting life. And this is a, a worldwide uh, initiative between the UN and Europe. Um, so you know, plants, plants provide 80% of the food we eat and uh, feeds the other 20%. So it's just creating more awareness and, uh, and creating that uh, communications under, over, under plant health. Uh, we got a great kick off to International Year Plant Health when last January Michael D. Higgins, our president, um, planted a tree uh, to kick off the year in the, in the Phoenix Park. Uh, but unfortunately, due to COVID, some of our planned events uh, could not take place. But uh, we're getting them back up online and getting information, information out there and hoping to, to link in with, with Tree Day in the autumn and that sort of thing. Um, and if anybody that someone this evening would like to get more involved or get to uh, hear more on International Year of Plant Health or any initiatives they'd like to carry out, we'd be delighted to, to hear from them. Uh, we also have a newsletter that goes out to all professional operators that's registered with us. 
uh, that goes out uh, quarterly, so the, the first one went out there in July. So again, that'll be a way we can, we can keep people up to date and create that awareness. So then I want to the, the opportunity. Um, we think there's a massive opportunity to promote the sale of Irish grown oak trees in Ireland's protected zone. We're the only uh, full European state in Europe that have, have, a, have a, 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 a pest-free zone for oak possession in March. So it's a massive opportunity for the sector. And also, um, we have the advantage that, that we were the last country in Europe to have a finding of oak possession possessory mart. Uh, it being uh, an interception because it was from imported product. And you know, we should be able to take advantage of the learnings and uh, the knowledge uh, gained from, from other member states. Um, going back to that slide we showed of the, of the map uh, around London of how the, how, the, uh, how the pest spread. So we should be able to use that to, to help us uh, maintain our protected zone. Uh, the amenity sector in 2019 was worth 77 million. Uh, there's no reason why, with the with the proper controls in place and and everyone doing their part, uh, including that from uh, that we can't increase this uh, this output value uh, by exporting oak trees. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this evening on the update on oak possession in March. And uh, the email address is there if you want to contact us for any further information. And we would also like to thank the UK Forestry Commission to see them for sharing information and OPM images uh, with us because as, as stated in the presentation, we only have the one image of OPM. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Noel. Declan, thanks very much. I have my mic off. So that's another euro for Pieta House. Um, there's a, a few questions have uh, come in there during the presentation, so we will start off with them, if that's okay. Um, Helen Grogan has asked that uh, the member of the public that found OPM, um, was the member of the public familiar with horticulture and pests and diseases? Or do you know maybe you, you were dealing with the person? Yeah, um, no, it was just a, a lady out walking. Uh, she had no background in horticulture whatsoever. Um, she was walking in the morning and she seen the, the nest and she took a photograph and she went back to the same route to, that evening and took another photograph. And then um, I think she she put in, Googled a uh, caterpillar and an oak tree and then she found oak possession mat. But I think she done an excellent job on, uh, on reporting the, the case. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's done a great service too everyone to have found that so quickly um so it's a, it was great and to have the the look of having a plant passport on it on the plant as well helped trace it back even quicker um is there any requirement to retain the plant passport on trees that are planted for any length of time or is it just that was so, pure good look okay so the requirements under plant passports is this passport is required um between professional operators on the smallest traded unit. So if that's one plant, it's one plant passport. If it's 20 plants, it's, it's uh, one plant passport of the same genus and species. And if it's a truckload of, of plants that are the same genus species, it can be one plant passport. Then for plants of protected zones, uh, that plant passport is needed to the end user, okay? So what we would encourage is, uh, the professional operator that's that's selling to the end user for a protected zone plant needs to send give a passport as an end user, and then you know, I suppose it's it's your responsibility as the end user then that if there is an issue with that product or that tree, uh, that would be very useful to have that plant passport to aid us in in a following up a, a, an interception or a or a pest issue. Um, but it's the responsibility of the professional operator to provide that plant passport and also keep records for three years. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, there's a question from Dermot Callahan as well about the, where is the oak being imported from now and what is the size of the market landscape? There's some crows outside my window, so I'm gonna just close the window, sorry. Okay. You can answer that question there if you'd like. So, um, so at the minute, um, I suppose it's, it's 
we're coming to the time of year where people will be planning uh, oak oak planting and setting out schedules of it. Um, but um, I think a lot of Irish oak being used and um, like oak can still come in if 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 they can meet the conditions that we've set out in the legislation. So from a pest free area, that's that's a um, that's uh, put together and and rubber stamp from the MPPO uh, all can still come in from them pest free areas within Europe. And you're being notified now of uh, presumably there's no oaks being imported imported over the summer, but were you getting notifications early on to say where things were coming from and that Belgium's uh, a kosher country to import from? Yeah, so we had um, that. That legislation went in in early February, and uh, we've had had we've had notifications in of of oak coming in, uh, but the numbers have been small. But we'd expect that to to increase uh, in the autumn time. Okay, um, and the it's a trees over one point two meters and over eight centimeters eight centimeters in girth have to be notified. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they have to meet them conditions. So anything under that size, there's no problem bringing it in. Uh, it's just to pre-notify it. Okay. Um, okay, thanks very much. So maybe I there was a question came in there about legislation to protect plants. And I think it was earlier on, and maybe I'll put it to Declan and to Richard to comment on if there's any further legislation that's required or if we apply everything that we have, is that sufficient to protect our our ornamental stocks, our commercial opportunities, and maybe the the environment as well? Uh, and maybe Declan, you have your your microphone open there, so I'll start with you, and then Richard, I'll, I'll let you come in as well. Yeah, well, I think the the legislation, the new legislation that's that's come in in December, is is definitely a lot stronger than than what was there previously, um, and I suppose the you know, as legislation gets stronger. I suppose pests and diseases are getting stronger as well. So I suppose it's a it's a moving feast, but I think we're we're pretty well up there now that, that we have a, a robust system and legislation there to to protect uh, plant health. Mm -hmm. okay. Richard, have you an idea, or, or I suppose you have a different perspective from being in Northern Ireland as well? Yeah, so I, I can speak from the research or the scientific point of view, not so much from the legislation or, or policy point of view. Um, one of the issues we often have with these things is that by the time we know what they actually are, it's already after spreading. So ash dieback is a prime example of that. Ash dieback was first, symptoms of it first seen around 1990 in Poland. And by the time someone had, the, the, someone had put the effort into studying the fungus, isolating it, figuring out what it was, doing experiments to show that it actually did cause disease, it had already spread several countries. These these studies can take years and it's because they're practically difficult, but also because it's scientists are busy with loads of other stuff as well. You know, we're trying to manage lots of things at the same time. So one of the issues, I guess, as background to, to the rest of my answer is that this, the science often has a hard time catching up with things like um, plant diseases. Like Declan said, I think we'll, we'll give the new legislation a chance. There's an awful lot in it that's very risk-based, which is great. It's about um, um, more more risk-based surveillance, pest risk assessment. Um, it's it's got kind of the ethos of this idea of uh, of a white list as opposed to a black list. So the old legislation is said to be blacklist. So that means kind of everything's allowed until it's banned. Whereas this new legislation is sort of more white list, where where um, Sorry, have I got that wrong? Yeah, whitelist, so the things are banned until we know that they're safe and they're allowed. So that's what the high-risk plants is all about that Declan mentioned. Just as, a, as an add-on here, um, maybe instead of looking at legislation, we could we could look at um, kind of, instead of stick, if we look at carrot. So maybe like Declan said a couple of times, there's opportunities here as well, if we can uh, foster and, and encourage a, a local, more local production of these plants, that would be great. We, we don't always need to legislate for these things. You know, we can let the market kind of take hold of it as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it, 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 I think w the new legislation is, is good. There's an awful lot of science gone into it in the background. And we, we'll see how it goes kind of thing. Um, yeah. I, I think I think that some, there's some carrot needed as well as stick, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Richard, I suppose it was unfortunate to see oak 
being in the news last week as well because none so hardy nursery were looking at destroying 1.2 million oak trees or saplings because they hadn't a certain market for them um, and it, it shone a light on the growing speculatively um, instead of going to order or to a certain market so they it's great in spite of having a market opportunity there are difficulties in that as well in developing it um, but it's a good idea I suppose another thing that came up recently and, and Declan will be familiar with there was um, uh, unsolicited seeds being posted to a lot of countries um, from China and I think there's probably a lot less plant hunting going on now but people have access to things like Alibaba and are importing seeds as well and maybe some greater awareness there would would be useful but I, I guess seed, um, seed is probably less risky than Importing plants with soil. Uh, I don't know if uh, yeah, technically you have any idea of in interceptions. Yeah, uh, currently with about uh, 40, 40 odd uh, reports of, of unsolicited seeds being sent to people. Um, so we've been following it up, and again, we use social media for that and had a good response from it. Um, and uh, we've asked people to send in the seeds, and we're arranging the destruction of them, them seeds. Uh, most of them at this stage um, are, are are safe enough seeds. They're, they're kind of like cabbage seed and, and that sort of seeds. Um, they're not anything to be concerned about, but yet that risk is there that um, that it could have been invasive species or or uh, it was factor they're, they're unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, you can see we're just going a little over time, so unfortunately we've got time for just one question. Um, and then I'll announce the results of the polls. Um, Liam Kelly asks, excuse me, and this is a question for Declan, were all, tr all the trees associated with the, that tree checked out to see that they were clear of the moth? Yes, yeah, so the, the tree um, that the nest was on, first of all, the plant passport was on as well. So that brought us back to the nursery where, where them trees came from. So we took the tree out where the, where the nest was present and, and um, destructed that and then we trace back to that batch of trees uh, where that tree came from and located all of them trees and um, destroyed them. Now you can imagine the job it is to do that because at this stage now we have um, the park involved, the county council involved and the nursery that imported the, the trees involved and lucky enough the county council planted themselves so there wasn't a landscaper in between which there could have well been a landscaper in between. Um, mm -hmm. And then from that then, we checked out the, the nursery to see was there any issue with, with other oak trees um, in the nursery or we want to establish was there any trees left from that batch in the nursery. So there wasn't any trees left from that batch and um, we checked the, the nursery, what oak trees was left in that nursery. We also stopped that nursery from trading in oak in order to give us a chance to, to assess the, the issue. And then as regards to the area in Dublin and the wider uh, public area and parks around that, uh, we, we put more staff into that. I suppose it came at the time of year that we had staff that couldn't do other things because of COVID. So we were able to do a good uh, survey on, on a lot of the parks in, in the South Dublin area and public areas. So we're, we're, we're pretty happy. We're, we're happy enough that um, we haven't missed anything and that... Um, that at this stage it's just a one nest. Okay, okay. Declan, thanks very much. Um, I'll just uh, conclude with the, the results from the poll. So I I'm not sure if, it, if everyone can access them, but um, do we, I asked three questions. And the first question was, as a grower, which are your greatest concerns relating to plant health? 40% um, of people said staying up to date with legislation. 20% said introduction of invasive pests that can escape from the nursery. 20% said loss of saleable stock. And the last 20% said destruction of stock. So staying up to date with legislation is a concern. Number two was have you benefited from the protected zones that Ireland holds? 20% um, said yes, it keeps out some pests. And 80% said not really. Uh, so that's a, an interesting result to see. And 0% said, yes, I can sell some plants that other countries can't. And our last question then was number three, have you personally experienced the destruction of plants due to presence of a notifiable pest? And 60% said no, and 
40% said yes. So there's a few people have first-hand experience with that. So with that, I'll conclude the meeting. I'd like to say thank you very much to our presenters. Oh, that's my last slide. I just moved. Sorry, um, there we go. Um, to Declan Keeley in Department of Agriculture. Thank you very much. And to Dr. Richard O'Handlin in AFWI. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to present this evening, but as well to prepare the presentations in advance of this as well. It's been really informative and very interesting. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will still have um, some questions and will be thinking this over for a while. So thanks again. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll be back again in about a month's time with maybe another uh, meeting. So if you have any feedback, um, you can drop me an email and I'll try and help you out. And the content and the presentations will go up online in the next week or so. So we'll just uh, at that, I'll say thank you very much and um, thanks for your questions. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Good night. Thank you. Thanks everyone.